They called Avengers Infinity War the most ambitious crossover event in comic book history. Let's give that claim a run for its money. I can't remember when I saw Scooby Doo meets Batman for the first time, but I know it shaped me as a person. Technically, it first came out in 1972, but was released on home video in 2004. The DVD had two episodes on it the dynamic Scooby Doo affair and the Caped Crusader caper. At first glance, what does a gaggle of teenagers and a talking dog have to do with a billionaire superhero and his ward? The longer I think about it, though, I get it. Both teams love a good mystery. They are routinely up against weird people and funny little outfits, they both have iconic cars, plus when you take in Batman's penchant for adopting odd teenagers, the dots are connecting. The two crossover episodes inspired a later addition to the Scooby Doo Batman universe, the feature length film Scooby Doo and Batman the Brave and the Bold. Both episodes and the movie feature the Joker, the episode's secondary villain is the Penguin, and for the movie it's a new guy named Red Cloak. This isn't the last time that Batman and Scooby Doo cross paths. In 2019, Scooby Doo Guess Who aired. It was a show that was created pretty much for guest stars. Lots of big names were featured, including another run in with the Caped Crusader. This time, Batman is looking for Alfred, who, get this, is an honorary uncle to Daphne. So now we know that Daphne and Alfred are close family friends. Picture this you are in New York, you're having a great time by the river, and then massive titans come out of the water and try to make you lunch. That's exactly the day New Yorkers had in Attack on Avengers, the 2014 Avengers and Attack on Titan crossover. The story was first released in Japan and then released in the US the next year. I'm guessing that most of the people watching this video know the Avengers, but for the 0.1% that don't, they are a Marvel superhero team. For those unsure about Attack on Titan, it's a Japanese anime series that takes place in a post apocalyptic world terrorized by Titans. Titans enjoy humans for lunch and are basically giants that are really hard to kill. Luckily, the Avengers have dealt with tough guys before and put up a solid solid fight when the titans show up in NYC. Right at the end, we even get a visit from the colossal titan, the biggest and baddest of them all, and hopefully he gets taken down when the guardians of the galaxy also show up. We don't know exactly how it ends, as the comics last panel is just Iron Man telling the Avengers the battle isn't over. So it's a cliffhanger with no concrete resolution as of right now, but maybe soon. There was this weird time when the X-Men were fighting Mojo in the X-Men Volume 2 Issue 10 and ended up in the Mojoverse. The Mojoverse is inhabited by beings that are addicted to TV, so the way to rule the population is to make the best TV. Putting in people's favorite actors, remaking films, and Mojo's choice is Wizard of Oz starring the X-Men because the X-Men bring in great ratings true there and here. Mojo calls it his Wizard of X and the cast list is as follows. Longshot as Dorothy, Wolverine as the Cowardly Lion, Rogue as the Tin Man, Cyclops as the Scarecrow, and Beast as Toto. The gang follows the yellow brick road all the way to defeating Mojo. It wasn't easy, but they did it. While this choice may have been unexpected, it wasn't totally out of left field. Marvel has actually done The Wizard of Oz before in 1975. That collaboration was equally unexpected because it wasn't just Marvel and The Wizard of Oz, DC was there too. The Wizard of Oz comic was the first time DC and Marvel published something together. Joint publishing wasn't the original plan, it just so happened that both companies were developing a Wizard of Oz comic at the same time, and having two Oz comics out there would not have worked out well for either of them. So Stan Lee called DC up and suggested the joint venture, it was accepted and made comic book history. After the success of Christmas specials from other popular studios, Disney wanted something similar. In 2009, they aired Prep and Landing on ABC. The story centers around the elves that get people's houses ready for Santa's arrival. Proper tree trimming, nut free cookies, things Things like that. The special did really well. It won awards and everything, so it's no surprise that Marvel wanted in on the Christmas action. In 2011, Prep and Landing Mansion Impossible was released as the backup comic in a few Marvel issues. It followed the same two elves from the animated special as they decked the halls of the Avengers Mansion. The charm and humor of the comic rests in the fact that the elves have no idea who is in the mansion. I guess the Avengers worldwide fame has yet to make it to the North Pole. They think the Hulk is a Christmas fanatic because he's green, and the Avengers A stands for awesome. It's a super cute comic to get you into the holiday spirit, so bookmark it for December. Marvel's main universe is sometimes called the Prime Universe, especially fitting when Optimus Prime is involved. That's right, the Avengers and the Transformers have teamed up. 
Technically, it didn't happen in the Prime Universe. I just thought that would be a cute intro. Marvel was producing Transformer comics as early as 1984 in a successful 80 issue run, even though the characters were originally property of Hasbro. They had the characters licensed, but then lost them a few years later. But as luck would have it, in 2007, they were back in business with the new Avengers slash Transformers. The basic plot is that tensions are high between Latveria, ruled by Doctor Doom, and neighbor Simcaria. The Avengers and Transformers are are trying to prevent a war. They are teammates by the end, but it was a rocky start. When the Avengers first saw the Transformers, attack mode was initiated. I think that's fair. Imagine one day a gaggle of massive robot cars shows up with blasters. I'd panic too. Everybody calms down eventually and works together to save the day. Bringing in the Transformers was a really good move because that meant Iron Man got Transformer sized armor, and any win for Tony is a win for me. The Looney Tunes and DC Universes are almost the same age, both founded in the 1930s. The Looney Tunes is a family friendly film and TV animated franchise. It's super lighthearted and almost always leans into the slapstick form of comedy. Then on the other side is DC. DC started out a bit goofy and lighter in content, at least when you compare it to what it is today. Nowadays, when you see DC, media, it typically has dark themes and screens and is generally pretty serious in nature. But when both franchises are owned by the same parent company, no crossover is off the table. Starting in 2017, an epic comic crossover between DC and Looney Tunes was in full swing. Crossover event was titled DC Meets Looney Tunes and featured 10 pairings each getting their own issue. The issue would start with a comic done in the DC style and then the second was drawn in the style of Looney Tunes. It was a fun series with fun character designs if I do say so myself. There have been DC crossovers on TV too. In a 2003 episode of Duck Dodgers, Daffy Duck accidentally gets his dry cleaning mixed up with the Green Lanterns. Daffy turns into the Green Loon turn for a bit but eventually returns the suit. TMNT the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have had the pleasure of fighting alongside everyone's favorite caped crusader, Batman, multiple times. There was a six issue comic series, Batman slash Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, released in 2015. Part two was released in 2017. Part three in 2019. In 2016, a spin off mini series called Batman slash Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures was released. And then an animated film in 2019 called Batman vs. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So they are basically best friends at this point. Part 1 and 2 of the comics and the adventures miniseries are the TMNT being transported into Batman's universe, whereas part 3 is set in a different universe that the turtles and Batman both just live in. The film is kind of a mashup of the comics. In the comics part 1, the turtles were desperate to get back to their universe because the thing that created them was considered an anomaly in Batman's world and if they stayed too long, they would slowly die. That didn't fit in with the plans for the movie too well, so they used the universe from part 3 as the base and then some of the plot ideas from part 1 for the story. The film got really good reviews. People seem to enjoy seeing this pairing and studios are hopeful for sequels in the future. So I'm sure we'll see them together again soon. In the show Riverdale, I know we don't like to think about it as a society, but unfortunately right now we must. In the show, there is a plot line where all the characters get superpowers. I wish I was kidding, but I am not. It's always been the most random plot choice to me. Imagine my shock and surprise when I find out there may have actually been source material for it. While the Archie and the Punisher crossover has no correlation to the show, it hopefully inspired that plotline. Archie and the Punisher was a shocking collab because those characters have nothing in common. Archie is this wholesome high school kid and the Punisher is not that. He is very rough around the edges and aggressive. The idea of pairing these two up actually started as a joke. That joke was mentioned to a higher up and suddenly it wasn't a joke anymore. There aren't any universe transfers, Riverdale just exists in the Punisher's world. So the Punisher is tracking this bad guy named Red, who looks a lot like Archie. Of course, Archie is mistaken for Red, but once the Punisher realizes it's not him, they end up kind of working together to get Red captured. I don't know if the Riverdale CW writers planned or stumbled into this, but in the show, Archie's character does become his own kind of Punisher and starts a vigilante group called the Red Circle. Maybe the Riverdale writers were not just spinning a dartboard for plot points and were actually trying to subtly bring the comics to life. When Debbie Ryan said she sat down with the president of Disney Channel and told him she wanted to make history, she was talking about an on screen wedding, but she should have been talking about the crossover she had with Spider Man. The episodes aired at the same time, and no one knows why Disney chose this pairing, but Jesse is set in New York, so that might have been a factor. The episode is titled Halloween Night at the 
Museum, a nod to another famous now Disney movie. For those who weren't watching the Disney Channel at the time of Jessie, the show was about an actress who moved to New York to pursue her dream, but she needed a survival job. That job was being a nanny to the four kids of famous actors. It was like she was a nanny to Brangelina, basically. This was a live action show, so what are they doing on Ultimate Spider-Man? The plot is basically, it's Halloween. There is an exhibit in the museum on Camelot. A suit of armor contains the evil Morgan de Frey. She is released and then Spider-Man and the Jesse crew have to put her back before she plunges the world into total darkness. The Jesse crew isn't transported to the Ultimate Spider-Man universe, they just exist there, which implies that there is a universe where everybody in the Disney Channel universe and the Marvel universe exist together. Where is the sweet life of Wanda and Pietro? Make Miley Cyrus a Hannah Montana Dazzler. The sky's the limit. One time, my friends went thrifting and told me they got me a present and it was Phineas and Ferb Mission Marvel on DVD and I put it on display. It was the first Disney Channel Marvel crossover and it was surprisingly perfect. The show was the perfect setting to poke fun at Marvel and having it make sense. Phineas and Ferb as characters just fit right in next to the heroes with their superior engineering skills. They reference iconic MCU lines. Stan Lee has a cameo. It's perfect! Okay, so the drama. Dr. Doofenshmirtz created the power drainanator to suck the mayoral powers from his mayor brother, but it got the Avengers instead. Their powers end up in Phineas and Ferb's space station containment unit, but no one knows that till the end. So the whole thing is about trying to get the hero's powers back while keeping the tri-state area safe from the villain squad. Candace and Isabella are the ones to go to the space station and get the powers back in the end. The lineup for the final battle is wild. Modoc, Whiplash, Venom, and and Red Skull are up against Spider-Man, the Hulk, Iron Man, Thor, Harry the Platypus, Phineas and Ferb as Beak, Baljeet Hulk, Buford as Bear Boy, and, and Dr. Doofenshmirtz shooting waffles. I know that that sounds ridiculous, but the battle is basically the endgame battle in a different font. The events of this show take place in the same universe as the ones from Jesse, at least that's what we can assume, as the voice actors for the heroes are the same ones from Ultimate Spider-Man. Thanks so much for watching along y'all, don't forget to like, subscribe, and make your mark on the comments section down below. Let me know which crossover shocked you the most or which one you can't believe I missed. This is Juliana signing off. Bye!